Good afternoon. I'm Kate Sears Witowski, Programming Director for Expo Chicago. For our next program, I'm thrilled to introduce Humberto Moro, Deputy Director and Senior Curator at the Museo Tamayo and Expo Chicago's Exposure Curator as the moderator for exhibiting Latinx artists in an international field connecting Mexico City and Chicago. We are deeply grateful to Humberto for his continued partnership with Expo Chicago, and I encourage you to review his thoughtful selections of artwork as a featured curator on our Expo Chicago online platform. Since 2016, Morrow has been an adjunct curator at the SCAD Museum of Art in Savannah, Georgia, and has previously held curatorial positions at the Park Avenue Armory in New York, Museo de Mex, Mexico City. Umberto will be joined by a member of Museo Tamayo's Young Collector Circle, Fatima Gonzalez, Laura Caroline Delara, and artist Harold Mendez. Welcome, Umberto. Hi, everyone. Hi from um, Mexico City. And thank you so much, Kate. Um, very happy to be um, moderating the panel exhibiting Latinx artists in an international field and connecting Mexico City and Chicago. I'm so happy to be surrounded with amazing colleagues and friends today to expand on this conversation about the very interesting and complex connections between Mexican, Latinx, Latin American and international communities in Chicago and Mexico City. Um, the representation of these communities uh, in these regional environments, as well as thinking about market forces, scholarship and patronage, uh, all these through the lenses of two institutions, the, the Paul Art Museum in Chicago and Museo Tamayo in Mexico City, as well as with the company of two very dear colleagues, um, Harold Mendes, um, an cultural agent, Fatima Gonzalez, and of course, um, Laura Caroline de Lara, who's um, recently appointed interim director at the DePaul Art Museum. Um, as usual, I want to thank everyone at Expo Chicago, Kate, Alexis, Tony, and Steve, who have done an outstanding job uh, in the past days, bringing us an excellent online experience full of incredible art and programs. Uh, this, I think, is the next to last program in, uh, in the fair, so we're very excited to be closing um, the day. And also please feel free to send any questions our way. We will be very happy to address conversations with the audience as we go. Now, um, I think everybody is gonna come um, online now. We're gonna be able to see uh, our guests now as they're, they're turning their cameras on. Thank you again for being here. I'm gonna start uh, with a little biographical information. Um, first, we have uh, Laura Caroline de Lara, who adopted her position as the DePaul Art Museum's interim director in July 2020, uh, having been the collection and exhibition manager and associate director since 2016. Uh, previously, Laura Caroline was the collection and exhibition manager at the Richard uh, Driehaus Museum of Chicago managing exhibitions, publications, and the collection. And she was also um, SAIC Rogers Brown Study Collection uh, Registrar, where she propelled the collection, the collections organization from 2010 to 2011. She earned her dual masters in modern art and history, theory and criticism and arts administration and policy in 2012, also at um, SAIC. And she has held previous positions at urban art commissions in Memphis and the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Um, Fatima Gonzalez uh, also joins us from Mexico City. She's, um, she's a blocks away from me, I think. So that's, it's, it's good to build close. Um, Fatima is a co-founder of Gonzalez Hassan an artist center initiative which aims to increase visibility of artists whose works explore concepts of social political relevance and encourages critical thinking but it also goes beyond market practices through exhibitions publications research and curatorial projects uh, gonzalez hassan uh, is a firm that's based between mexico city and new york uh, previously fatima was a sales associate at Curimansuto in mexico city where she developed strong relations with Mexican and international artists, curators, 
uh, collectors and institutions. She's currently a faculty member of the art department at the Universidad Iberoamericana in Mexico City. And she has other work experience, including uh, working with Ricky Trevanille Studio and the Colección Patricia Feltz at Cisneros in New York. She holds a BA in communications from the Universidad Iberoamericana and an MA in critical theory and art from the School of Visual Arts in New York. And last but not least, a first generation American born in Chicago to Colombian and Mexican parents, Harold Mendez, who's work, who works with installation, photography, sculpture, and text to reference reconstructions of place and identity. Uh, his work addresses the relationships between transnational citizenship, memory, and possibility. And his selected exhibitions include 2017 Whitney Biennial, obviously at the Whitney Museum in New York, the MCA in Chicago, the Renaissance Society, PS1, Studio Museum in Harlem, the Drawing Center New York, Museum Contemporary Photography Chicago, and so on and so forth. And he's also part of the Latin ex American exhibition on view at the DePaul Art Museum, um, to which Laura Caroline will talk about in a few in a few minutes. But first, I will start speaking about the current show on view at Minnesota Mayo titled Otros Mundos or Other Worlds uh, before, turn, before hearing from our panelists. I think first here it's important to say that uh, Museo Tamayo was founded by Olga and Rufino Tamayo in 1981 with the idea of presenting international art, but that notion of internationality has changed dramatically since then. We have the internet, we have sort of like a hypermobility, and now the artists themselves are receptacles of that same internationality. And additionally, there's a legacy of the museum presenting this kind of a service since 1995, where we hosted the first um, group show, which was representing 17 international artists working, living and working in Mexico City. So in that sense, um, the discussion of articulating the global through uh, um, or from a local lens is within the very DNA of the institution. And the show Otros Mundos, which is um, the Spanish uh, word, gender neutral world um, for other worlds. Um, it's, it's a term that uses the X and you know, in Spanish, um, technically all inclusive uh, vocabulary exists at the margins of what the um, Royal Academy of, of Spanish in Spain considers proper or considers adequate. So in that sense, um, all inclusive language is sort of a gesture to recognize different identities. And, and for me, what was interesting about the X and also thinking about the word Latin X is what it represents, this kind of refusal to be categorized in any pre-existing labels at the same time that it embraces all forms of identity. And in that way, the exhibition, uh, which is a 30,000 square feet exhibition that takes the whole museum, uh, presents the work of over 40 art artists uh, from different countries like Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, Republica Dominicana, many cities in the United States, France, who are, who are all living and working in Mexico City. And from their worldviews, um, they're thinking about new forms of inhabiting social, political, and civic, and also personal spaces. And, and through their research and artworks, they're putting these paths forward for the public to analyze. So if we can go back to the first slide, please, that is an installation by Pia Camille, who's um, an art Mexican artist working, living and working um, in, the, in the outskirts of Mexico City. And um, this, this is two bodies of work that um, um, uh, one that takes in consideration sort of like macroeconomic forces and the transnational drift of these t-shirts. And then the second group of work is um, a group of several paintings that she presented last year, which were dealing with grief, with motherhood, with nourishment, with the idea of, um, of her being a mother, with the idea of, of her father passing. And you know, like these two bodies, very distinct bodies of work articulated the idea um, 
of the second wave of feminism, the personal is, is political. And that was this idea of resilience, of domesticity, of endurance, sort of like open the show. And in that sense, uh, the exhibition presents these kind of micro ecosystems, little worlds where you have the opportunity to um, have a, a, a deeper dive in an artist's practice instead of just having a couple of works in a group show. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is a presentation of six, 16 different paintings by uh, Noé Martínez. Noé is a, a first generation Spanish speaker who comes from an indigenous community in the um, Southwest of Mexico. And he is using language and he's using imagery and sort of like these conceptual maps to reclaim his own legacy and his own history, sort of like tracing the history of slave trade in Mexico and the Caribbean, which is um, has been treated very differently in Latin America. And these kind of stories have been obliterated. So he's, um, he's tracing his own very particular family history. And he's also making a big, a, a bigger, wider argument. And um, it was also important to think about articulating the work of these artists with uh, an older, more established generation of artists. And when I say articulating, I mean to trace very specific lines about the influence and absorption or dialogue between these younger artists and some figures that have let, left a strong legacy in the local arts community. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is an installation by Julieta Hill, who is an artist and an activist. And she, um, she sort of um, made a digital recuperation of uh, one of the main monuments in Mexico City, uh, L Angel de la Independencia, the Angel of Independence, which is in Reforma Avenue, after um, some of the marches uh, against the, uh, the violence um, uh, with women. So she was able to enter this monument and sort of like take pictures, which she um, translated into a three-dimensional model. She also works with the idea of power uh, in buildings and through the symbols that are part of architecture. So we have a couple of 3D renderings of um, architectural elements or sculptural elements within um, government buildings. Then the next slide is a um, special commission in the central patio of the museum, which is a very icon iconic space in the museum. And this is the Sontle, a duo um, that works um, from architecture or from the arch architect's perspective, they were thinking about the format of, of, of a type of colonial construction, which was um, named something like the, herm the hermit's shack, uh, una ermita. And they were thinking about these spaces in a way that um, they <clears throat> became spaces where a more sort of like horizontal, holistic life could be um, have. And um, they are thinking about a spiritual space, a space for producing food, a space for inhabiting, uh, a space for creation, a system of uh, water collection. So these are very sort of like a conceptual um, construction that could be a ruin from the future, has no temporality, but also has some um, relations to Mayan architecture and also to the brutalist architecture of the um, postmodern building that the Museo Tamayo is. So they're, they're thinking about the exodus of um, cities and uh, how can we think of our more sustainable life in, in, in current times. And the production and presentation of this show um, also happened in parallel with the formation of Museo Tamayo Contemporary Circle, uh, which is an initiative, a group that seeks to connect uh, with a younger generation of collectors and patrons and accompany them in a mutual, in a mutual learning path. Um, just thinking about growing together as they dive into the world of patronage. And it is important to mention this contemporary circle, uh, not only because Fatima, who's a, a founding member of this group, who's here today with us, but because um, the, the majority of the funds for this exhibition came from this group. So in that sense, it is incredible to think about young people encouraging and fostering the career of other young artists. Um, 
so that was kind of like the framework of this show. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, this is my final slide, which is an installation by Jan Gersberger, who's an artist from France that has been living in Mexico for a couple of years. And um, this um, sort of like total work of art, which is considering the museum wall, walls, as well as three different tapestries that he created for this space. He's thinking about camouflage and the idea that camouflage is a natural pattern that has been designed to hide the human body. So that was uh, relevant for that group of words. And um, this is the exhibitions last week. And um, it has been a privilege to present uh, this show in a time where local communities need to be represented and embraced at the same time that their work has been empowered and disseminated by the museum's platform. And it, had, it has also been amazing to share a bit of this exhibition with you today. And um, now just in sake, of, in sake of time, I would love to pass the mic to Laura Caroline and invite her to talk to us about the exhibition Latinx American and the Latinx Initiative at the DePaul Art Museum. Um, so thank you for listening and uh, all yours, Laura. Thank you so much, Umberto. I appreciate it. And um, thank you, Expo, for having me. This is a great opportunity just to hear, you know, what um, other colleagues are working on. And Umberto, if I could hop on a plane and fly to Mexico tomorrow to see the show, I totally would. It looks incredible, even just online. Um, but I am, yeah, I'm excited to, to kind of um, introduce our Latinx American exhibition um, that while I have recently become interim director of DePaul Art Museum, um, had worked pretty hand in hand um, with our previous director and chief curator, Julie Rodriguez Widholm, um, in kind of sparking what we're calling our Latinx initiative, which is a multi-year um, initiative on the museum's part to really focus on um, Latinx artists and their representation within our museum galleries through exhibition um, by adding and acquiring works to our permanent collection by um, more Latinx artists and um, really focusing our programming over the next few years on, uh, on those artists and the, the themes and discussions that come up in our works. Um, and so much of that was really sparked um, through just our own research and looking at, um, you know, the number of other uh, institutions and kind of what the numbers looks like in sheer volume of exhibitions and collections and realizing that there, you know, within the United States was a real hole in, um, you know, the representation of, of artists um, with these backgrounds. And so what, what we really wanted to do um, was to essentially begin to kind of put together this Latinx initiative as um, kind of an inquiry system and an, an exploration into um, you know, the different artists that are working both within Chicago as well as throughout the United States um, and really throughout Latin America to think about the ways in which, um, you know, the artists that we are seeing and talking about regionally um, are in fact operating on this really international level and kind of the conversations that can be had um, between uh, you know, our local artists and um, those that are, are operating from, from other states and from other countries. So um, for us, the exhibition has got about 38 um, different artists, again, hailing from Chicago, California, Texas, Puerto Rico, Mexico, um, Venezuela. And we're really, it's an interge intergenerational group exhibition. Um, and we have been really kind of exploring the term Latinx within the first um, few programs that we've been doing because we knew that this was um, sort of a term as Umberto really brilliantly and beautifully laid out um, earlier as being the sort of gender inclusive non-binary way um, of encapsulating and incorporating everyone into the conversation. Um, but knowing for sure that there are a number of artists that are included in the exhibition um, that prefer other types of identifiers. Um, and so those are things that we have also been exploring with the exhibition and with the programming as well. Um, and really thinking about sort of what those terms mean, how labels are used in our kind of art historical sphere um, and the ways in which we can kind of push and play with that a little bit. Um, 
one of the things that uh, is also worth noting for sure is that this, um, much like Umberto's, is a um, complete museum takeover. So the Latinx American exhibition is the first and second floor galleries in the museum. Um, and this slide that's up right now um, is an exhibition um, sort of alongside the Latinx American exhibition uh, by Claudia Pena Salinas called Quetzali, which uh, it was curated by our assistant curator at UNI Behar. Um, and is an incredible sort of discussion around repatriation um, and thinking about the uh, Pinacho de Montezuma in Mexico that was um, sort of taken and reappropriated in Vienna and has been sort of long discussion around that. And so a lot of this has been kind of thinking and talking through, um, you know, those cultural points that um, kind of carry artists between borders um, and the ways in which, uh, you know, culture begins to present itself in different ways. Um, and so for us, in addition to kind of featuring these 38 artists, a lot of it is really beginning to think about, um, you know, the makeup of our city, the makeup of the university that we work in, um, DePaul University which has got 16% of the student body is Latinx um, and really beginning to fold in the conversations that these artists were having with the broader um, sort of Latinx conversation um, throughout Chicago. So um, I'm excited to kind of talk about it on an international framework now. And uh, this particular image as well is one of Harold Mendez's work, who Harold is with us now as well. Um, but this is as it's installed in, in DePaul Art Museum. And I know that Harold's going to go into um, kind of the background of, um, of, of his work. But I did, I mean, I want to point out Harold to you too, just what a pleasure it's been to have this work in the museum because with so many exhibitions as, you know, curators and programmers and that kind of thing, you get the install up and we're thinking so many, you know, years in advance in terms of planning um, that it can be easy to kind of go in for your tours and then get out and move on to the next thing. And to, um, you know, spend time with your work and sort of laying out flowers on a weekly and bi-weekly basis, refilling the mask with distilled water on a regular basis, it's a really, it's a pleasure to be able to sort of go in and spend time with the work and careful, concentrated thinking with the work in ways that we don't often get to do um, once the show goes up. So I'm excited for Harold to talk a little more about, about his work as well. Well, thank you for setting that up for me. That was very nice. Thank you, um, Umberto, and you know everyone for the invitation to talk about the work. And and um, you know I think there's some really interesting crossover between you know what we're doing uh, wherever we are right now, and um, particularly talking about you know, you know Latinidad and artists you know like myself who are you know partly raised in the United States but also spent time moving between you know Colombia and Mexico. You know, for me these are the, this is the kind of constellation in which I'm thinking about the way that my work is sort of, you know, comes to be, right? So I'm constantly looking at the Americas, I'm looking at artifacts, I'm looking at kind of materiality. Um, um, what you're looking at here is actually a work that was uh, commissioned by uh, the Logan Center for an exhibition that I had uh, last year. And it's actually on view in this slide here at the ICA in Los Angeles, which was um, a 10 year career survey, which is touring right now was organized by Jim James. Um, and, you know, this is actually just sort of the, the, the beginning of the, um, the, 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 the show in Los Angeles. And there's about 20 works um, that range between sculpture, installation, sound. And then like Laura Caroline mentioned, there are these works that require a kind of a gesture. Uh, for instance, the laying down of, you know, carnation petals or water that, you know, is, you know, placed inside a kind of a vessel. Um, you know, that sort of takes these kinds of shapes, if you will. Um, and so what you're looking at here is this, this kind of uh, fiberglass grid. Um, and, you know, I've asked the, the institution or, you know, the museums to, to kind of tend or to care for these works, to kind of keep them living, if you will, rather than them being these kind of static objects. So then in some way, um, you know, by constantly changing or, uh, sorry, adding you know, flower petals to this work, there's this, you know, temporal quality to the work. Um, there's a durational, you know, you can kind of see, you know, uh, the accumulation of uh, flower petals 
um, either drying or kind of be, being freshly placed. And then, you know, in the back, you have uh, kind of a, a full uh, installation, sound installation that's constantly moving and altering between, you know, uh, six different speakers. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see a small vessel in the back. Uh, this is actually something that I worked with at the Field Museum in Chicago uh, with an anthropologist that primarily was focused on work from the Americas. So it was, look at, you know, it was sort of doing some research, um, looking at um, objects that have to do with this idea of transformation, whether in a very kind of literal sense or maybe a kind of a metaphorical sense. Um, the vessel on the right is what's known as a chimu pot from, from Peru. And it's this object that would often be found in burial sites. Uh, which uh, was 3D scanned for me by the museum. Uh, and then I had it 3D printed and then it's reanimated with sound. There's like this uh, speech, uh, this, you know, this uh, unidentified speaker that's sort of contemplating the, the body in, in a state of crisis, if you will. So there are all these kinds of aspects about um, bodies that are maybe abstracted or that have this kind of agency uh, they're constantly moving, whether it is a kind of an object that's maybe found in a burial site, the voice, you know, which is detached from the, from the body, if you will, you know, this more poetic uh, gesture of, you know, flower petals, and then this kind of object on the left, which is sort of grounding the, the, the visitor or the viewer in a way um, to kind of place them in a, um, you know, in a, in a, in a location. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, so this exhibition, like I said, traveled, which is now open at uh, the ICA VCU uh, in Richmond. And um, this is, these are just a couple uh, sort of installation views of the, sh of the show. Like, again, you know, there's about 20 works in the show. So the, the, on the foreground, you have the sculpture that also uses the kind of grid in a, in a maybe more architectural way with the flower petals, but that object that looks like a kind of carcass on there is covered entirely with Cochino insects, right? And these are these things that are indigenous to Mexico and, um, you know, some places in Central America. Uh, and then on the back wall, you have a, a work that I made specifically for the show, which is this uh, towering uh, sheet of glass that's been burned. Um, so this is very ephemeral quality to it. It's this image of a monument that has this kind of shroud over it. Um, um, and then in the back, you can kind of see the, 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 the other installation that I just showed. And then if you go to the next one, um, and then here's, you know, kind of a sculpture that's foregrounded as well. And then also some um, um, more research-based work. So I kind of, you know, jump between, you know, working in photography and uh, sculpture, but there's a lot of materiality. There's a lot of research that, that goes into the work. And, you know, I, I oftentimes um, am making these kinds of works that at a distance, they appear one way and then up close, you know, they kind of, they kind of appear to be something else um, or that there's a, a, a kind of a veil, if you will. Um, although in some instances, the exhibition looks very monochromatic, it's actually not. There's actually quite a bit of, of color um, um, that's in the exhibition. Um, what you're looking at on the back wall here is a diptych of uh, these two um, kind of uh, strands of, not strands, these uh, barbed wire that runs across, meets in the middle, which is broken. So the barbed wire doesn't run all the way across. And the image is completely covered in this powdered uh, pigment, like charcoal and graphite and a mixture of other things. So when you see the work at a, at a distance, it really appears as this kind of very, uh, um, very lush kind of sooty, uh, very velvet-like, very black kind of surface. It's almost the image is not really visible up until, you know, as you kind of approach it, the image kind of appears and the barbed wire is, is to the scale of actual barbed wire. Um, and then if you go to the next one, and, and then maybe this is just maybe like, I think the last view, um, you know, a, a, an image that was, you know, you know, some research that I was, that I've been doing in Medellin, in Colombia, um, since about 2014. Um, and these are works that I've periodically uh, uh, worked on, um, you know, and that, and that research has taken me, you know, to uh, not just, you know, Colombia, Mexico, but Cuba, you know, uh, parts in Northern and Western Africa. Um, and then there are these kind of sculptural um, works on the side here. So I guess what I, you know, will just end with is by saying that, you know, there's this kind of zigzagging, right? That that's going between, you know, um, you know, the US, the Americas, um, and you know, thinking about ideas about representation in the body. 
through image making and then also the kind of long history of materiality and objects uh, and thinking about that in Latin America and the way that that is sort of being brought um, into a practice. So um, I'll, I want to, you know, hand it off to Fatima. She can talk to us a little bit about what she's been up to. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Harold. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm going to start by talking a little bit more about my experience. Um, Humberto gave a good introduction, but I started my career in Mexico City in contemporary art when I was um, quite young. I, I, most of my career has been developed in the gallery ecosystem. And I moved to New York about the same time as you did, right, Humberto? So like 2014. Um, and I moved to New York to, to study. I stayed there for a while and uh, very much understood how different the arts and the culture is organized in the States. And it was um, an important moment for me to realize that I really had to come back and work in Mexico. Um, I, I came back in 2016. I worked at, um, came back to the gallery I worked for before moving uh, to the US, but, but I guess working in, in New York very much gave me this clarity that I had to come back and reconnect with uh, my generation of artists, of collectors, of um, curators, you know, just with the whole ecosystem. Um, until very recently, until less than a year ago, I worked um, at Curimansuto, where I was very fortunate to, to, to develop my career and uh, started working on my own, um, co-founded a project with a Mexican partner who was based in New York um, called Gonzalez Hassan, as an Humberto briefly explained, um, we're doing a very flexible kind of kind of uh, work no we're doing um many collaborations i've been collaborating closely with umberto with the uh, um, circulo contemporaneo we're collaborating with artists uh we're working very closely with young collectors so i guess what we're doing right now and what we understand that it's very necessary for our generation is developing and professionalizing the, the careers of young artists and uh, doing this crossover across New York and Mexico, but also working um, very close in hand with young collectors, no? Um, developing philanthropy, developing ideas of patronage. I think um, my work from a commercial standpoint has very little relevance if I start, for example, working with a young collector and um, start a conversation and achieving an acquisition that has very little relevance if I'm not talking about um, that young uh, new collector supporting the institution that at the same time is supporting um, the young artist. No, um, I understand that the work we have to do for Mexican and a Latin American artist and the conversations we have to have um, for the arts really have to be 360, really have to be about the whole ecosystem rather than uh, a commercial standpoint. So that's a little bit of what I've been doing. I've been really lucky to, to be close to Humberto in this past year. I've uh, been really lucky to, to have many conversations about this with him at the same time as the exhibition of Otros Mundos was heroically achieved um, in very difficult times of pandemic and very difficult time for institutions in Mexico, um, which I think it's important to, to mention. Um, because, therefore, you know, philanthropy is, is um, such an important thing to develop in, in young uh, collectors and young public in Mexico. And, I think that's it. This was an event we co-organized. If you, you can go back to the, about two weeks ago um, with a contemporary circle that keeps growing and growing. And I guess that's it for my part. Well, I wanna um, 
Thank you, Fatima. Thank you, Harold. Thank you, Laura Caroline. Um, I think um, I wanted to, um, you know, open the, the floor for discussion. We, um, we have been thinking about different ideas, but I think it's very interesting um, first to have different voices. You know, like we have um, the voice, you know, like of a museum director, of a cultural agent that's working from patronage, from sort of like also advisory. And then we have a voice of an artist that's also part of um, the museum show. So each each one of um, of from each one of us from our own perspective and from our own environment are working towards shifting different narratives or you know like uncovering different narratives to uh, push back from regional insularity. That's that's kind of like a notion that we spoke about a lot uh, in our previous conversation and how this idea of how um, insular both of our cities can be and also how you know, like nuanced and layered and complex the, the environments in which we live are um, sort of like call for us developing a practice that goes beyond of, of, of our personal interests. And I think from our own perspectives and from our own practices, we're all sort of like trying to achieve um, um, greater representation for artists, um, either Latinx artists or international artists working in Latin America. So I think I think there are very strong points of connection. So I was wondering um, what um, what could you say about this idea of, of, of regional insularity? I think um, one of the things that we've kind of come across um, at in doing this work at, at DePaul Art Museum is, um, you know, that this idea of, of regional insularity is in some ways, in some ways feels false now that we're in it. I mean, there's this sort of um, balance between, you know, not wanting to come at it from this sort of like globalized idea in the way that you know, has been done previously, but instead to really think about the ways in which um, those regional discussions and the kind of regional interactions that artists are having with each of, within each of their individual cities, whether that's Chicago or Mexico City or LA, um, are a critical part of that dialogue, but that is also part of kind of this larger discussion um, on what it means to sort of operate um, you know, between countries or between cultures and um, what it means to begin to have those kinds of conversations um, on, a, on a global or an international level, but bringing to that kind of what your um, particular sort of regional bent is and that it ends up being the sort of incredible mix of both similarities in terms of what artists are experiencing um, in terms of difficulty and representation and that kind of thing, but um, also a real uh, turning point, I think, for, for having so many artists and so many curators and thinkers get together and talk about it on a broader scale. Now, Harold, you mentioned before that, you know, like you being from Chicago and, um, also thinking about um, this drift that you sort of like had to exit that environment to sort of like be considered back again in the same environment. Can you can you tell us a little bit about your own experience with uh, with this path that's um, that I think it's very similar in many environments. Yeah, I mean, I think early on, uh, you know while I was working in Chicago, um, you know, I, I actually was more trying to focus on uh, the practice and developing that as a means to, to, to get institutional representation, right? To try to think about how do I get my work to the museums first on my terms, you know, uh, on the terms of my, my kind of practice rather than let's say, you know, uh, you know, 
it being dictated by the market or by a gallery forces or that, that you know, because it, it does happen, right? Like you do see that. And I mean, it's also, you know, I wasn't really making, you know, that kind of work uh, early on. And so, you know, I think outside, in Chicago in particular, like there's a couple spaces where you can have um, the opportunity to have maybe a solo museum project or a kind of a group show. But then, um, you, you know, there are these kinds of um, artist run spaces and, you know, like you can kind of do the rounds, but at a certain point, um, you know, you have to look elsewhere. And I think that's just, I, I felt like I kind of, you know, didn't want to keep doing that. I wanted to really kind of expand. And so what I started to do was really look at residencies and really thinking about research and travel. And I was getting pulled to kind of go to more to Latin America and really thinking about, you know, my own kind of history and thinking about like how those things informed, you know, a lot of my work. And I think that really gave me a really strong basis for, um, for, for developing the practice. And I, you know, that's just something that I was able to kind of continue, um, you know, going from like a three month residency, let's say at the Headlands to the core program, which is like a two year residency. So the amount of focus, you know, just allows for a different kind of um, work that you can develop. Um, and it's just interesting now that, you know, maybe in the last, you know, few years that, you know, in Chicago, there's been a little bit more activity where, you know, I think people are asking me about the work a little bit more. And um, I mean, and that happens, I think for a lot of artists that are in Chicago, you know, there was a huge exodus that went to New York. There was a lot of artists, you know, that are in Los Angeles from Chicago, uh, but there's a lot to stay there, of course, you know, it's a really rich, rich community. Um, but I think in my case, it was something that I just, I needed to kind of roll the dice and go elsewhere and really develop my practice um, in different ways and not really rely on, you know, like I, I didn't want to think about like in Chicago, like I'm, I'm showing in the West Loop, like I've made it like that's just that wasn't really enough. You know, I was just like, okay, how can I show New York? How can I show in Los Angeles? Like, how can I, you know, have my work be uh, visible in Europe and other places. And I think, you know, just really opening it up. And I think that's what I appreciate about like artists, particularly like in, um, you know, in Latin America, right, they're really able to have a kind of representation of their work globally rather than it just being in a, in a regional kind of location. And I think in the United States, it's, it, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Now, something that I want to ask, um, you know, like just to, just because of the fact that you are part of the Latinx American show at the DePaul Art Museum, um, and we get to hear from you um, what what does it mean for you to be a part of a show such as this? I mean, I think it's great. I mean, there's not, you know, there aren't that many exhibitions. I mean, I think right now there's a few that are kind of popping up, but, um, you know, I think in our earlier conversation, you know, we had this um, long sort of debate, not really debate, but we had a long chat about, um, you know, the idea of like people having to learn about what Latin American art is, right? There's a lot of curators, a lot of uh, patrons that really had to kind of uh, inform the public about what Latin American art is. And I think, you know, it, this is just the beginning, right? Like, I think that the idea of Latinx has to kind of also be a way to educate people about what that means. And that's also a very generational thing, I think. Um, I mean, I think, you know, of course you wanna be in dialogue with, you know, people that you respect, people that are making really amazing work. Um, and, and I think it's a really uh, important term to, to, to grasp, right? But I think that there's just so much work that needs to be done in terms of how the public and institutions um, are able to kind of support, you know, Latinx artists, you know? Um, and then I'll, I'll just kind of pivot that by saying, you know, we talked about, about this before as well, but like, it, you know, in the early 2000s at the NCA, you know, you know, Julia Rodriguez, you know, organized that show about artists from Mexico City. And then you know, there was a show at, at PS1 in New York. Um, and both of those exhibitions were really great at focusing on art from, you know, from Mexico, right? Mexico City. And and is in all of its nuanced ways, right? But like, you know, you often hear of collectors and uh, museum boards, you know, going to Latin America and doing studio visits and really kind of getting a sense of the lay of the land. That doesn't happen the other way around, you know, like the, there aren't either in the United States or in Latin America, these kinds of groups going to kind of get a sense of like, well, what kind of artists, you know, like in my case are making work, but are also having this kind of connection to Latin America, you know, and it's a tricky place because you're kind of neither here nor there. Um, 
so I'm glad that it, the exhibition exists because it, you know I think it's really important and that it continues to exist um, so that it can really reflect all these nuanced perspectives. Um, you know, yeah, you know, looking at something you know like artists working in Miami, right, versus New York versus Los Angeles, they're all really different in that sense. I'm glad. No, I think. Sorry. Go on, go on. I, Sorry, I brought up a lot. Of, I, I brought it up a lot there. <laughs> You did, no, but it's super helpful. And I'm glad that you brought up the um, sort of the aspect about uh, our learning and needing to sort of provide those resources for, um, for patrons and for institutions and for us as an institution to think through that as well. I mean, I think that's really where the Latinx initiative was sparked for DePaul was really just wanting it to be this kind of question and it wasn't necessarily that DePaul was going to come as this like end all be all have the answers to everything version of this because we never I mean we can't and um, I think there's so much more exploring that we as an organization want to do within our collections but also outside of it to get a better understanding of how contemporary artists are thinking about it now and how it's being received by galleries and other institutions and kind of what are the ways that we can help kind of steer that conversation but also steer others exploration into it because um, I think that's a, a big part of what had been missing was just sort of that own sort of institutional organizational knowledge and kind of getting that out. So I appreciate that you brought it up, Carol, because I think it's a, a critical point. Yeah, and also shout out to Julie Rodriguez, you know, just to think about how much of what we're speaking today is part of her legacy in, in Chicago and and you know, like the same the same kind of thing in Mexico City, because there have been that have paved the way for us to um, to be thinking about these issues and to be working uh, on. Uh, on the on this work that has to be done, you know, like in, in in a way, we have to be, you have to keep thinking about representation, about, um, you know, like really articulating these narratives in a way that that uh, gives something uh, to the communities that need them, and just thinking about you know, like that coming and going and coming back. Um, I want to talk to uh, to Fatima about the contemporary circle that we uh, are part of at Tamayo, because. Um, this was. This has also been sort of like an experiment to think about the way in which, you know, like young people are also encouraging through patronage and to this idea that institutions are not static or or or, or that need to be flexible. Um, obviously, the the Mexican model of institutions is really different to the American model, where a board like a single handedly sort of like sustains uh, an institution. In here, we have more participation of the government and the state. So, um, so in that sense, um, this contemporary circle sort of like had a first iteration uh, um, in, in the 2000s and, and then it sort of like died and we sort of like revived it um, last year. And then, you know, like I had, a, uh, I had a, um, a very meaningful conversation with Fatima about uh, what, what it meant for us to think about uh, a, what it meant for our generation to think about uh, in terms of patronage, because what happens in Mexico is that you have five five people, which are the same people that are always uh, supporting exhibitions, um, exhibition catalogs, um, public programs, and you see their names everywhere. And they, you know, like they have done a lot for the environment, but you know, like just thinking about what we need to do a generation to change that and to, like start uh, start accompanying people from our age to learn that um, that you know like the, the the life of a of a of a patron an institutional patron um, does not have to have a return of investment or does not have to have a, 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 an idea that's uh, that goes beyond of giving for for the sake of giving something so that I think that conversation was very important with Fatima I don't know if you want to say something about this Fatima um well as I kind of said before I think it's very symbolic that this program was um was activated again at the time of your arrival um I guess that that it coincided with this exhibition that you were proposing that as we have 
talked about with Magali, the director of the museum a few weeks back, had not happened in Mexico in 15 plus years. There used to be uh, biennials that uh, depended on, on, on uh, private money, et cetera. But there hadn't been an exhibition of this nature in so many years. And I think it just makes perfect sense, you know, that you came, came back, a new team came back to this incredible institution as the Mayo, that this happened. And then everything, just like energy attracts energy, you know? Then we started talking and we both have this idea of how different patronage has to be, of how different the, the career as a patron or the path as a patron, that these conversations have to happen from many different spaces. You know that um, we were talking about this uh, a few weeks back again, that the conversations have to come from, from everywhere, you know? and that this idea that the gallery space is not, is not completely opposite to the institution, but that we're allies. Know that it's something that I, I think it has to be reinforced in, in Mexico. That again, that the, the conversation has to be 360, and that there are many conversations that have not been had in, in the past years. No, so this idea, these ideas of philanthropy. Well, I don't think the generation above us, este Umberto, we're, we're talking about this these ideas as strongly as as we are. Again, I am also coinciding with a very difficult moment for institutions in Mexico, no? With a cut of a, a, of a tremendous cut for budgets um, for, for all institutions in the arts. So it's um, really an, an, interesting, an interesting time with, I guess, interesting um, leaders in, in institutions. Yet, I think um, these conversations ha ha are, have to be very constant because it's not a natural conversation of philanthropy and patronage. Mm -hmm. So it has to be reinforced from many different places, from the artist studio, from the gallery, from the uh, institution, from, um, no, it has to become a more natural conversation. Um, and to, and I think uh, also very important is to, to communicate to people how important it is, no? Again, we were saying this, what, what happens with your money? How, how tangible it can be your your um, participation or your donation to a museum. Again, going back to, to this example of Otros Mundos, it's really amazing no? to say this was achieved um, from the help from 15 people who joined the circle it, a month before the exhibition happened. So, so how important and how, um, yeah, how tangible the, the, the contributions of, of young patrons can be. Um, for the future and for the rest of this um, presidential um, period. Now, you know, like also we were, this show pays special attention to the idea of inter intergenerational representation, uh, which is something that we spoke um, before. Um, and I was, you know, like also sort of like bringing the conversation a little bit back to Expo Chicago and just, you know, like to acknowledge the fact that we are being hosted by uh, affair and that this program is uh, you know, like being provoked and, and, and yeah allowed by um, affair which uh, does you know, like sort of like it's the, the, the catalyst of so many things and we were also thinking about how um, Latinx arts and Latin American art artists um, have been uh, establishing such a market force. And you know, like particularly um, as I have seen um, the digital program of Ex Expo Chicago this year, it's 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 extremely palpable how uh, how strong uh, the Latin X and the Latin American uh, representation has been. So you know, like um, also you know, like with the thought that we're not like there's nothing pure anymore. We don't exist separate to the market. We all are involved uh, in this phenomenon. So I, I, was, I was curious to, to hear your thoughts about that. I, I can say that from the museum standpoint, um, at least from DePaul Art Museum standpoint, for us, it's sort of this interesting, like bittersweet moment in that we need and want to be fostering these conversations and we want to have this you know blow up in ways that are so important for the artists in order to you know have them supported in 
museums and galleries and, and other types of institutions. Um, from the gallery world standpoint, it also makes it really important for us to be having those conversations with patrons in ways that we haven't previously. I mean, and, and to kind of think through new ways of funding, because the hope of course is that, you know, so many of these artists begin to, um, you know, are able to garner bigger, more representation, eventually meaning market-wise that at some point their prices go up and for large part, some of which DePaul Art Museum is not going to be able to afford to purchase any longer, you know? And so um, it's kind of this twofold thing where we're wanting to get the artists to a point where like they're supported, they're able to continue with their practices as their sort of main focus. Um, and in order to do that, we as an institution also have to be thinking really particularly about um, how we are able to garter our own funding in order to add a lot of the um, works into our permanent collections and kind of what that looks like and how we kind of foster those conversations for, for ourselves and for the artists as well. Now, I know that um, you, Harold, have um, had very interesting uh, thoughts about this. I don't know if you want to share those with us. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, I was just joking the other, the other day that I think until um, the, this, this, you know, this term of, you know, Latinx artists, you know, at the point when I think that they become, like, as a group, right, uh, has a real market kind of force when there's, I think that's when more institutions, more collectors, more patrons will actually pay attention because that's just the way things are in that. In that. And it's unfortunate, right? And I think that there are a lot of curators in a lot of these museums and institutions that are already doing that work, that are getting work, that are, you know, really supporting artists. Um, but I think up until, um, you know, it's a real kind of market force that, um, you know, you have, um, you know, people from different sectors, you know, like, you know, tech, uh, entertainment, um, you know, and, and maybe specifically, maybe like, you know, um, you know, Latino collectors, you know, acquiring work in that way, then I think that th that's going to really kind of change a little bit. But I don't see that right now. I think that has already happened for Latin American artists, you know, like that, you know, that, you know, we can, we can see a lot of really amazing, like, very important works um, in major institutions, uh, you know, by awards or by artists from, you know, Latin America, right, you know, all over, right. Um, and I think that it's just now kind of trickling in where I think a lot of curators are starting to kind of collect that from Latin X artists. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm also if you you know, like that, oftentimes, like the board, you know, like if they already own that work, then they're more than likely to want to, you know, have that or buy that work for the museum rather than maybe the museum saying, hey, you know, I really want to get this work because I think it's really important, you know, at an early stage for this artist. And I mean, I don't know, I'm not in those, you know, conversations, but I do see it from the outside too. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I, we're, we're kind of skirting around this thing where I think a lot of what we're also talking about is this idea of scholarship, right? Like, how do you, how do, how do we build scholarship around the practice institutionally also within the market, right? So that these things are kind of happening um, in a holistic way for the artists that feel like you're moving in the right direction rather than you're being taken advantage by the market, you know, or, or something like that. Um, so, you know, I don't want to put it all in the hands of, of the market, you know, and I think obviously we're, you know, having a conversation mostly focused on institutions and museums. And I think that that's where I, I think because there are civic spaces and there are public spaces, I think it's really important that for, for the work to be really done there because it needs to be done there, particularly in the United States. Well, I think that's a, a, a really beautiful idea to uh, sort of like wrap up this panel because um, you know, like the thought that we're working and advocating and fighting for a more holistic ecosystem in which uh, many players from many different fronts, from the institutional world, from you know, like our residences, from advisories, from um, circles of patronage, are um, 
working towards a more uh, just environment and a more uh, equally represented environment. I think I think that's kind of like the main idea that I keep from our conversation. And um, yeah, it's been it's been amazing to listen to you and to hear what you are doing from uh, each one of your practices. So I want to thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, I invite you to learn more about the the Paul Art Museum on their website and visit their exhibition. And also Harold has a pretty neat website and Gonzalez Hassan, who's, um, which is Fatima's advisory firm, is also pretty amazing. So please um, also come to museotamayo.org. And of course, um, keep uh, your eyes open for Expo Chicago's program. So thank you so much, everyone. And I hope we can meet very soon in person for that happy hour that was promised earlier today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Umberto. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone.